Hello and welcome back to Wheel Analysis. And as always, I want to thank all the nice people that support this channel on Steady or PayPal. Now today, we actually start with our analysis course by talking about sequences and limits. Therefore, let's immediately start defining what a sequence is. More concretely, we will say that we have a sequence of real numbers when we have a map from the natural numbers into R. And most of the time, such a map gets the name A. In the same way, also a map A from N0 into R is called a sequence. Please recall, here in the natural numbers we don't include 0, but here in N0 we do. So you see, the choice here just depends if you want to start counting with 1 or with 0. Now when we deal with sequences, we seldom write down such a map, but rather an infinite list of numbers. In other words, when we put 1 into the function here, we get a1. And we put the 1 in the index. And then we get a2, a3, and so on. Therefore, please remember, formally a sequence is a map, but we will use shorter notations. For example, what you often will see is just a n inside parentheses. And then to remind you that it is an infinite list, we put n in n in the index here. Of course, if we want to start with 0 here, we will put n0 in the index here. Alternatively, we could also put the starting number here as n is equal to 1, and then remind us again it's an infinite list, so we put infinity on the top. Now, if from the context the starting number is clear, we can just omit everything and just use the parentheses. Okay, I think that's enough about the notations, let's immediately look at some examples. The best way to describe a sequence is just to give a rule for all the sequence members a n. For example, we could say a n is equal to minus 1 to the power n. And then we can use the parentheses to denote the whole sequence. So here you see, this is a very simple sequence, because you see the first number is just minus 1. And then the next is 1, then minus 1 again, and 1 again, and so on. Therefore, if you want to visualize this on a number line, we would start at minus 1, and then in the next step we jump to plus 1. Afterwards, for the next step, we jump back to minus 1. And then we know we continue this whole procedure with no end. Here you can remember, this is always a good way to visualize a sequence on the number line. So you can see the sequence as time steps where we hit at each time step a number on the number line. However, this is not the only way to visualize a sequence, because we already know it's simply a map. Therefore, you could also just draw the graph of this map. In other words, we have a set in this coordinate system, but please remember, we have as the domain just the natural numbers. But the codomain is the real numbers, therefore on the y-axis we find r. In conclusion, we don't get a line in this plane, we just get points. For example, at 1 we find minus 1, so a point here. Now this is very important, we have minus 1 as the value of this map. In the same way, we have 1 as a value when we put 2 into the map. And then we can continue with 3, 4, 5 and so on. Now the jumping we had before, you now see here when we go to the right. Indeed, we are very interested in what happens with the values of the sequence when we just continue here on the line. Roughly speaking, what happens to the sequence when n goes to infinity? For this example you see, not so much will happen, because you still jump between minus 1 and 1. It does not matter how large our n is, the jumping is always the same. For this reason, let's look at another example. Here, our sequence should be defined by the rule 1 over n. Now you immediately see this is way more interesting, because we get out different numbers. The first number is just 1, but then we have 1 half, then 1 third, and then a lot of different fractions, because the denominator gets larger and larger. Now also this sequence we can visualize as a graph. There we just start with the value 1, then the value 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, and so on. 
Here, in fact, something happens when we get larger and larger. Because you see, we get closer and closer to zero. And this is what we will define soon as the limit of the sequence. So here we recognize that this sequence has such a nice property, but the sequence from before does not satisfy such a rule. However, before we define the limit as a property of a sequence, let's look at another example. Here I want to have the numbers that are given by the powers of 2. In other words, we have 2, 4, 8, 16 and so on. Of course, this is a very nice sequence, but now we want to look what happens again when we increase n, so make it larger and larger. Then you see, the values we get out also get larger and larger. And indeed, there is no upper bound for the members in the sequence, so we could say this limit should be infinity. But of course, we don't know what this means exactly, so we have to clarify this as well. In order to do this, let's jump to our next definition. Here we will define the notion of a convergent sequence of real numbers. We say that a sequence an is convergent to a given number a if the sequence members an lie arbitrarily close to a eventually. Now before we give the formal definition, let's visualize this idea on the number line. So here we have the point a and in green we have the epsilon neighborhood of A. This means for a given positive number epsilon, we can look at the number A plus epsilon and A minus epsilon. And the whole region in between we call the epsilon neighborhood of A. Please note here that A does not denote a sequence anymore, but just another number. This is just a common notation. Now if we want to have A as the limit of the sequence in some sense, we really need to get closer and closer to A with the sequence members. Or in other words, eventually all the sequence members have to lie in this epsilon neighborhood of A. Only finitely many can lie outside. For example, here we could have A1 and there A2. But at some point we will find an index capital N such that all the sequence members afterwards lie inside the epsilon neighborhood. So what you should see is that this is really needed if we want to make sense out of the sentence a n gets closer and closer to the point a. Therefore formally we now would say there exists a capital N such that for all n greater or equal than capital N we have that the distance a n to a is less than epsilon. And this distance we can measure with the absolute value. Please note, this means exactly the same as saying a n lies in the absolute neighborhood of a. However, here you should see, this only describes the convergence to the point a if this works for any epsilon. So no matter how small the epsilon is, this always works. Of course, if we choose a smaller epsilon, we may have to choose a bigger n here. In the end, this does not matter because we still have infinitely many sequence members inside this epsilon neighborhood and only finitely many outside. And with this, you have the full definition of convergency. Now, the opposite of this we simply call divergence. So in the case we don't find such a limit point A with the property above, we call the sequence divergent. We have already seen two examples where it's very obvious that we can't find such an A. But of course, you really should write down a correct proof for this. However, maybe it's more interesting to first look at our positive example. Or in other words, the sequence 1 over n is convergent to 0. So our A from above is now just 0. We have already talked about this, intuitively this makes sense. But now we are able to write down the formal proof of this statement. First you should note, since we have to show this statement for all epsilon, we have to choose an arbitrary epsilon at the beginning. Therefore the first sentence should read, let epsilon be a real number that is greater than zero. And we also already know what the last sentence of the proof should be. Namely that we have that the distance a n to zero in this case is less than epsilon. And this should hold for all indices n greater or equal than capital N. Hence you see the only thing that is missing here is the definition of capital N 
and the calculation to reach this result. Of course, here we can already fill in some details because we know the sequence a n. First, subtracting 0 does not change anything, so we have the absolute value of a n, which is of course simply 1 over n. Now at this point you should see, because we have this inequality, we have the other inequality for the reciprocals. Or simply 1 over n is less or equal than 1 over capital N. Ok, now with this we have filled in the calculation and now the only thing missing is that 1 over n is indeed less than epsilon. Of course we can define capital N as we want, so let's choose it so large that n times epsilon is greater than 1. Hence you only have to ask yourself, is this really possible? And the answer is yes, this is exactly our Archimedean property from our axioms. It just tells us that no matter how small a number epsilon is, we can always exceed any number we want, just by adding the number finitely many times. Therefore we just find a suitable capital N here. Now having this, we can finally read the proof from left to right and everything makes sense. And also, of course, our statement is proven. Ok, here you have seen what your thinking process should be when you want to solve such a problem. You start with the things you need to put in and the things you want to show in the end. And then you try to fill in all the gaps such that in the end you can read it from left to right. This means that sometimes you need to shift the things a little bit around to get your result in the end. Ok, I think that's good enough for today. I hope I see you in the next video when we talk about the properties of a convergent sequence. So have a nice day and see you then. Bye!